It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's how we go. Hey! It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's also a show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Breaking Bread with Tom Papa. You guys are the best. Thank you for joining us at the table once again. Very excited for today's show. We have Lori Wooliver, who is walking around and sharing with the world this amazing book, Bourdain. She worked with Anthony Bourdain for a long time and compiled all of these great uh, interviews and comments and, and stories about the great Anthony Bourdain. Such a good book. And I'm so glad that she's going to be joining us on the show today. I want to thank the good people at Scribd. Scribd like ribbed or fibbed a great great service no complicated credits they're an, a, an amazing amazing group you guys like reading you guys like seeing stuff you guys like uh having access to all the great books in the world like your dad stole my rake and maybe um you're doing great and other reasons to stay alive by that great author tom papa well guess what i'm available on scribd also you are going to love Scribd. You get instant access to millions of ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and more. Automated suggestions and hand curated picks make choosing your next book easier than ever. And they've got a great deal right now. Try .scribd.com slash papa for a 60 day free trial. That's dot scribd, S C R I B D dot com slash papa. And you can get 60 days of Scribd for free. We live in an amazing time when you can get all of the access to all of these books and all of this stuff just from your devices, just from your computer. And then you get, all, I mean, the, the, people would have passed out. Benjamin Franklin would have just crapped himself if he realized he could have access to all of the world's publishing. Thank you, Scribd. All right, so we, I want to get right to this because she's so great. Bourdain, The Definitive Oral Biography. It's a great, great book. I mean, the, Anthony Bourdain was just one of these special, special people that we were lucky enough to have. His, his legacy, his books, his TV specials, he was just, he, he was a rock star. He was a rock star. And I mean that in the terms that he was not going to just go with the status quo in any part of his life. He was always searching. He was always pushing. He was always looking to discover and be more. And he really is one of those like Lou Reed and uh, characters from New York where you just, they were just ballsy. They were adventurous and they put, they just took a no BS approach to their art. And Anthony touched so many people's lives. And when he passed, you just saw how the world reacted. And that only happens when people have been touched by someone. He's amazing. This book is amazing. I love that you can just pick it up and open it and just go to any section because it's just compiled of stories from everybody in his life. Uh, Jeff Allen, I'm just going to read some of the people off the back that are in this book. W. Kamau Bell, Anderson Cooper, Alex Lowry, um... Matt Walsh, Rob Stone, Sam Sifton, who has been on this program. It's just uh, the, the confluence of food and culture and life. And it's a really a celebration of Anthony's life. And Lori was able as the an insider in his life for such a long time. She this was a, 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 a passionate, passionate work of hers. The book is great. She's great. And I'm lucky that uh, we got to spend some time with her. So please, right now, welcome and enjoy Lori Wooliver. Nice to see you, Lori. Yes, thank you. Nice to see you, too. Congratulations on, on the book. Uh, I, and I, I say that coming from a, a kind of a strange perspective, because I know this is you're a great writer and you, you. You, you've written a ton of stuff on your own. But I know this is something very different. This is a, I just did a similar thing with a friend from college who was beloved and, and passed early. And it was my job to interview everybody to give a history to his daughter, who's now 19 years old and going to college. 
And wow. his wife had seen that I had written about him in one of my books. And she said, well, you go and gather more stories that we can give. And this was a fraction of what you did. This was just a, it was a literally, you know, eight people. Mm. And, and it wrecked me for the month of putting that thing together. It, it is a much different weight and to, and knowing the scale and the history and the, and the depth that you <laughs> in the amount that you compiled 450 and, pages. And then I, and then you have to go out and do interviews about it. This is a, uh, I hope at the end of this, once this is really sailed out there into the world, you get a nice break because this is, uh, a, 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 I just want to recognize the monumental weight of what you've done. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's, it was, um, and really cathartic, actually, because mm -hmm. uh, I got to meet with some people who I knew already and some people who I'd never met before, but all, everybody that had a story about Tony and, and loved him and had some insight into him. So it was like, like this extended shiva or wake or memorial service of getting to talk about this guy, ask questions, learn things I didn't know about him. And I thought, you know, I was his assistant for nine years and I talked to him every day and I thought I knew everything there was to know about this guy. And I right. learned a lot about him just in the process of, of doing the interviews. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how it, isn't it amazing just in life? Like even people that you're currently in these close relationships where, with, you never like interview them. You never ask them. Mm -hmm. So what were you feeling that day? when you mm -hmm. like? So they were very, were really unknowable. And I think that was kind of, in a very, in a very profound way, that was the attraction with Anthony, even while he was alive. I mean, when, when people leave us, you, you start searching for answers, but even while he was in the, in the throes of creating what he was creating, he was a guy that you just couldn't really nail down and figure out. And yeah. for me, that was such the appeal of watching him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was much more complicated. I, I think that the the first impression that a lot of people got and they maybe just ran with it was that he was, you know, the modern day Marlboro man. You know, he was tall and charismatic and, and funny and confident and brash. And he was all of those things. But he also was this kind of uh, slightly insecure, socially awkward, shy guy, which was mm -hmm. very surprising and, and you know, maybe didn't fit in with people's image of him. But if you met him in person, he was, he could really be that way. Yeah. You know, it was interesting in reading your book and hearing that part of the insight from a lot of people of the vulnerability or the, him being shy. And even in the, uh, in the documentary, they kind of touched on that too, on in that Roadrunner documentary. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of when I read Keith Richards autobiography, mm. because Keith Richards was this, such a rock star persona, bad boy thing. And then when you read his words, he was a, he was kind of nerdy. He mm. was Keith Richards. This ultimate badass was like this frail and he would speak so kindly about his mom and he had this little time. And that really matches up with, with the portrait of Anthony. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was this really interesting combination of very well mannered. You know, he was brought up in the 1950s and 60s and kind of the Mad Men era. And, you know, manners were important and books and culture and literature. And, you know, he went to private school, even though his parents really could ill afford it. And that is that's mentioned in the book as well. And then he catapulted himself into this world of, of you know, ex-cons and army guys and, you know, sometimes probably literal pirates, you know, and <laughs> drugs and, and uh, you know, the, the cook uh, bending the bride over the dumpster in the back of the restaurant, you know, all of that. So it was this, he really embodied both of those things, you know, this, uh, uh, this high and low culture. Right. It's such an interesting thing. I had, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, uh, the comedian Greg Giraldo, who had, mm -hmm. who had passed, he was a very good friend of mine, and he had a very similar, super strong attraction to, uh, for lack of a better term, the rock and roll lifestyle. Mm. Just loved in New York, loved the the underbelly. The I mean, the same like really respectful, but they just love that thing, they, that rock mm -hmm. star thing. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's a dangerous thing to kind of flirt with at times, but it's also very appealing 
Like yeah. whenever I get attracted to it, then I just, I go home yeah. <laughs> and, and <laughs> I'm like, I got to get up early. I can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, it speaks to, uh, the, the tendency to toward addiction, you know, mm -hmm. um, which I, as much as Tony was very open about his heroin habit in the nineties, I don't know that he ever really self-identified as an addict, you know, mm -hmm. I, bec maybe because he didn't go through the part where you go to 12 step and you do all that stuff. And he never, you know, he quit doing heroin, but he didn't, he didn't get sober, you know? Right. Right. Uh, and you look at him now in hindsight, and this definitely comes up in the book that he, he sort of approached everything addictively, you know, whether it was jujitsu or, you know, personal mm -hmm. relationships or, you know, literal drugs and alcohol or work or whatever it was, he was all in a thousand percent, you know? Yeah. 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 He reminded me of, uh, of, um, when I used to go see, and I'll just throw these names out, but, uh, Eric Bogosian, when I would mm -hmm. go see his, his one man shows and, and, uh, Iggy pop and Lou Reed, like he was of that time in New York and that kind of a guy, which was so mm -hmm. unique. Like the world mm -hmm. doesn't make those guys very often. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. Or maybe, maybe it does, but we're not like, we're now too old to, they don't resonate with us. You know, I don't know. I mean, is Harry Styles, the new Lou Reed? Probably not. But, no, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> we're too into bottled water. We know all the, we all know, we know what it means to be right. mentally unhealthy. We it's know, it, you know, it's kind of, kind of that part of it. So for your perspective, you, you got pulled back into uh, working closely with him after you had worked with him a little bit earlier, just helping with some writing, correct? That's right. So I met him in 2002. Initially, I had been uh, Mario Batali's assistant for a long time. And you were? I was. Yeah. Oh, man. I love Mario. It's he's a complicated guy. <laughs> he is a complicated guy. Yeah. I mean, you, you love the welcome. Here's an espresso. Here's some mm -hmm. funny stories going mm -hmm. your way. But yeah, yeah, that's that's like being an assistant for a volcano. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will say I learned a lot. I, it was a tremendous experience for me as a person. I was in my you know early to mid 20s working for him. Right. It was really exciting. And and I, I, I learned a lot. I got to see a lot of things. And um, yeah. You know, tough, yeah. uh, tough end to that story. But I know, <laughs> I know, it's so unfortunate. It's so unfortunate. But, yeah. But that's so, a, but that's a, that's a, that's a very uh, intense place to cut your teeth. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, you know, I met some of people who are still my good friends, and you know, it was it was an education in everything. Yeah. And so I had learned how to uh, write and edit recipes and do that kind of stuff with Mario. And so when I was winding up that job. Tony was looking for uh, someone to help him with the Layal cookbook, which was the first book he wrote after Kitchen Confidential. So he right. hired me based on Mario's recommendation. And I did that work with him on that book. And then several years later, I had a kid. I was looking to uh, to work part time just to do something that was a little more flexible than the magazine work that I had been doing. Right. And as it turned out, Tony's assistant was on her way out. And he said, well, I know, you know, you've maybe this is, this is like not what you want to be doing, but would you want to give it a shot? And and I probably wouldn't have been anyone else's assistant at that point, mm -hmm. but it was Tony. It was like, yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> I love the way you, the way you tell it in the book too, of the, the, just the, you, you really do sum up his character in such a great way, just in this interaction that you're explaining of. And then I sent an email and then he responded, yeah, uh, fine. You know, or mm -hmm. yes, you know, mm -hmm. very Tony. The way mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you're doing, but you do a really great job summing that up. It was now just to go back at just a hair. Were you at all interested in the food world before you met Mario? Like, was that an interest of yours, or did that bring you into this whole world? Yeah, no, I had actually just graduated from cooking school. Uh, oh, right, the culinary, I, right, right. Yeah, right. I thought I thought I wanted to be a chef, and after about two days of cooking school, I was like, "Ooh, <laughs> I don't want to do this." <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Why? Just, what happened? I mean, I love cooking, but I I I realized I didn't. I don't think I realized um, the way that you're cooking in a restaurant is different and, and right. difficult. And I I just know myself well enough to know that, like, oh, I don't think I have the like internal fortitude to do this day in, day out. Um, yeah, but I yeah. stuck with it, obviously, because, you know, once you pay your tuition, you don't get right. that money back. So I was like, <laughs> yeah. let me do this program. I'm very glad that I did it. I learned a lot of great skills, but I, I knew that I needed to figure out another way into the business that didn't involve being a line cook. 
Uh, yeah, and and as okay. it turned out, Mario was was hiring uh, his first ever assistant, and uh, he liked right. me. And you know, I, I whatever. I think I literally think I was the only person who applied for the job because it was back <laughs> so long ago that nobody knew who he was really. Right, right. So it uh, <laughs> it all worked out for everyone. So yeah, I, I always had an interest in food, but really. I knew I needed a set of skills because mm-hmm. to try and just make it as a writer, especially in the late nineties, kind of pre internet writing, it's like, well, I will starve to death. So Ooh. I need to have a job and have some skills and, yeah, and yeah. something and, and then figure out how to be a writer from there. So, so how was it working on the, on that book with Anthony? Was that, did it the, satisfy that part? Yeah, it was, uh, it wasn't so much writing as, as recipe editing and testing, but getting to okay. work with him, you know, which was mostly by email because he was already busy and traveling, but he was mm-hmm. great to work with. It was a great resume builder. And he wrote a ridiculously hyperbolic uh, piece about me in the in the acknowledgments of the book, which right. just was very typical of, of his style of he would not really stand there and go, you did a great job you know, give you a big hug. Like that was not who he was, but he would behind your back, you know, he would tell everybody else what a great job you did or he would write something about you. Uh, So that was a great, it was a great intro to him. And it, you know, it sort of sealed, sealed my, my fate as far as him trusting me and and being willing to hire me to, to work for him years later. Yeah. And then you come in as, as personal assistant and that is a very intimate relationship especially when somebody is so busy because Mm -hmm. then then you end up really being a part of every single part of their life. Yeah. Yeah. To an extent. I mean, there was, there was sort of a nice built-in boundary and that he was traveling so often. So we Mm -hmm. weren't like together in an office, which I think really suited both of us. You know, we could really um, work well together without getting on each other's nerves. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm always convinced that I'm getting on somebody's nerves. So it was like (laughs) that took all that, guesswork out of it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I was doing things like restaurant reservations and hotels and planes and and whatnot. And a lot of just, you know, just basic assistant stuff, but also, I, you know, one of the last times I saw him, I, I picked him up at the, uh, after he got a colonoscopy. So, <laughs> He's know, all goofy. <laughs> yeah. So there was that, you know, the, yeah. you definitely are aware of like, you know, who's, who's ready to go to get their prostate checked or whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. It, it always has to even like sharing anything with anybody. And then to but the, but he was so incredibly incredibly busy. I mean, I can mm-hmm. I can connect to a lot of that just from being on the road myself that what that does to you. And you know, it's very different when you're going out and performing by yourself and you're having an audience that's telling you great job, but that gig of you've got that crew with you and it's a lot of times really tough travel and it frays on your nerves and you just kind of have to think you're doing a good job mm-hmm. and you don't get, you don't really know until it really is edited and comes out. And then some, and even then it's not really that satisfying. Somebody says a good thing or they renew you for another year, but, you don't get that feeling of a mass of people saying, yes, you did it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, that's a recipe for really being a little lost. (laughs) Yeah. I think it could be very isolating and that definitely comes up again and again in the book that uh, especially in the later years, you know, at first when he was making television, it was a little crew, everyone flying and traveling together, staying in the same hotels and really, being together. And I think yeah. that was really fun. And then as it got bigger and bigger and he got more busy and more busier and busier, he would have his own van to set. And sometimes he would stay in the four seasons and the crew would stay at the, you know, holiday Inn express. And, right. you know, there started to be more kind of isolation in different ways. Um, I think the way that he was able to, to get that instant validation was he would do uh, these lecture tours, maybe once mm-hmm. a year, he would go out and do a bunch of cities uh, right. I mean, in fact, I think he had a little bit of a fantasy of, of being a stand-up. He he did. Um, he had, and this is in the book too. I interviewed Bonnie McFarlane. Yeah, I love Bonnie. Uh, I was happy to see her in there. She uh, she helped him get a uh, just a one night gig at uh, the Comedy Cellar, and he didn't tell anybody. Nobody was <laughs> there. He just went up unannounced and and did a set and. I guess it was all right. I don't know. I mean, he was he was good on stage. You know, yeah. he really did have. I wouldn't say he was a comedian 
at heart, but he was very, he could really hold a stage for an hour. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting thing reading, reading your book really, really kind of solidified that he was at his heart, a writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really was, he was, he was, when we talk about the rock star thing, it was the literary rock star thing. Mm -hmm. And writing is a very solitary thing, you know, like yeah. you, when, when you're really in it and really working, like you're shutting everybody else out. You kind of, you kind of have to, when mm -hmm. you're, when you're doing those, those things and the show and the thing that he became famous for after his, his successful book was the opposite of that. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, that's a, that's a weird combination to have to, to have to live. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, his, his discipline as a writer was always so incredible to me that uh, I, I just, I don't, I don't know how he did it. You know, he would, especially when he was still working as a cook, he would cook for, you know, you go in at maybe noon and you're there for 12 hours. Then you go up a few drinks with your coworkers after, and, and I guess he would sleep at some point and then he would get up at six and start writing. Yeah. And that's kind of how he wrote his, he wrote two crime novels and then he published Kitchen Confidential. It was just really, um, he had an extraordinary work ethic. Uh, but yeah, you have to, you have to, to be kind of, uh, make yourself lonely in order to actually get the writing done. Yeah. Yeah. It's a strange thing. I didn't realize he did two crime novels. Yeah. In 95 and 97, the, the first one was called bone in the throat. And the next one was called gone bamboo. And they're really mm -hmm. funny and really, I mean, they're, you see all that voice that really got developed further in kitchen confidential, but it's all there. Yeah. Yeah, man. He was very true to his voice. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. Like, cause you know, I've been in, I've got, through television things. And it was pretty remarkable that there's no, there's no part in his story where he had to really fight with the networks about like, there's like this mm. little tiny little, but nothing like they must've, I don't know if it was fortunate or if he was just so strong or maybe the show was so small in the beginning, but mm -hmm. he, he wasn't like, they weren't dragging him through like the food network processor and saying, you have to do it this way. Yeah. Well, and then once they did, I mean, there was a point, I think, after the first two seasons of A Cook's Tour, which was his first show, mm -hmm. where they did start to try and push him into doing more domestic shows. And why don't we just do a barbecue roundup or, you know, right. just, uh, they really <laughs> yeah. wanted to push him more into their mold because it's, you know, more economical and, and more what the people wanted. I mean, he was already right. kind of far outside the the norm for, for that network. Uh, so yeah. they they left, you know, they, he right. didn't want to be uh, a run of the mill. He didn't want to be the next Bobby Flay or Guy Fieri. He wanted to stay true to his own vision yeah. and voice. Yeah, man. The cultivation of a voice like that, it's, it's uh, you just have to be really kind of true to yourself. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a very, it's not many people do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was sort of the way that kitchen confidential came about was kind of lightning in a bottle. And, and I think that he was able to be so free with his voice because the original, the, the genesis of it was an essay that he wrote uh, intending to publish it in the New York press, which is a free, mm -hmm. you know, downtown newspaper. Yeah. I don't know if they publish anymore, but, and you know, he wasn't, he wasn't trying to hit the, the New Yorker voice or the, and you know, it was just something to make himself and his colleagues laugh. And, and right. so he, he didn't feel constrained. And I think the best writing comes out of that when you're just, you're trying to, you're writing it for your, for your buddy next to you on the line, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Who do you write for? You know, I have a, a colleague from wine spectator who is a little bit older than me and is really, really smart. And, uh, and I always try and think about writing to make him laugh because he's, mm -hmm. he's funny and, and educated. And, uh, you know, whenever I email with him, I'm always really trying my hardest, you know, yeah. I mean, in a, in a relaxed way. Cause I'm like, well, it's just the two of us reading it, but that's, yeah. that's definitely. And, and Tony, I mean, of course now he's not going to read it, but yeah. anything I did when he was alive, I always was kind of waiting for his reaction. And sometimes he would like things and he would say something. And then it sometimes I knew if I didn't hear anything from him that it didn't impress him. You know? Right. Right. <laughs> so it still yeah. keeps, I still keep him in mind for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. That's I've had people in my life like that or no longer here who work close to that. Like it, they're almost like the, your measuring stick of like how you're doing. Like mm -hmm. you always, I always think like, well, would Dave 
approve of this? Would Dave mm-hmm. think I was doing this? Is a, is it is this cool enough? Or would Dave think I'm selling out like mm-hmm. those people? Mm-hmm. They really kind of uh, they kind of when you think about it, they really help mold your personality. Yeah, because for you to carry them like that, that's it's almost mm-hmm. like they've become part of your subconscious. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I love the stack of books behind you too, by the way. It looks oh. like, <laughs> it looks like fall over. yeah, they're about to fall over. That happens it, all the time. <laughs> there is actually a, a bookcase that's hold. It's, it's like a spine, you know, but it's, I think I'm really pushing the limits of the physics there. So <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's impressive. <laughs> if you're looking for the right book and the right audio book, and you want to just sit down and get something and you can't go, you have time to go through walk through a bookstore. I love bookstores, but there's also a great service. It's called Scribd. You get instant access to millions of eBooks, audiobooks, magazines, and more. You also get thoughtfully curated editors picks, smart recommendations based on what you've read. It starts to learn what you like and keeps feeding you more of it. Look, streaming has revolutionized our lives in so many ways. And now with literature and books, it does the same thing. I mean, it's such a cool thing. I mean, we're sitting here talking with Lori and you could just go and access a book online. That's pretty amazing. You get instant access to millions of audiobooks, millions of magazines at one low monthly subscription. My book is on there. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. You should just get Scribd just to get my books. That sounds like it makes perfect sense. Uh, your dad stole my rake and you're doing great and other reasons to survive. And the book that I'm currently writing now that is ruining my life and uh, is just a giant weight around my neck and causing me to write on airplanes and uh, backstage of shows and in movie trailers. Wait, I, I'm sorry, I went off track. Scribd is the most fascinating library in the world and it's all at your fingertips for just $9.99 a month. Explore your interest in any, in any format. If you can, if it could be simpler, uh, they would just fill your uh, place up and your head with books that you've you've read. It's the only way to make it actually better. Scribd, honestly, is a great service. It's a digital library to the world. You can right now get Scribd a uh, sixty day free trial. Go to try.scribd.com slash papa. That's try.scribd s c r i b d dot com slash Papa and get 60 days of Scribd for free. So when you, um, when you were uh, his assistant for all that time, did you ever go on the road with him in those situations or were you at, 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 uh, at ground central? I mean, most of the time I was, I was home, uh, you know, back in New York with my kid and, and just kind of living a a regular life. But uh, at some point, when my kid was a few years old and I started to travel on my own and ask Tony for advice, he said, oh, you're, you're ready to travel again. Why don't you come with us? You can choose one location a year and I'll pay your expenses. And, uh, you know, you can just come and hang out and see what we do. And if you want to pitch a magazine story about something else while you're there, that's really attractive to a magazine editor because you've, you know, you've got your expenses paid to get to Japan right. and, you know, they don't have to worry about it. So I did that uh, for, I think, five or six years in a row. I went to, I always went to Asia because Tony was paying for a business class flight. So, you know, might as well really (laughs) milk it. Uh, So I went to, the first one I went to was in uh, Vietnam, in the city of Hue in central Vietnam. And then there were two back-to-back trips to Japan and then Sri Lanka, Philippines, and then Hong Kong was the last one. Wow. Wow. Oh, I did. I had some adventures. Yeah. That's like a dream list. Yeah. That's amazing. What was your highlight? Did you, uh, you know, there was a time when we were, we, uh, were in Kanazawa, which is sort of on the Northwest coast of Japan. And, uh, the whole crew was moving from there to Tokyo the next day. They were, they were driving with all the equipment. Tony and I took the bullet train from Kanazawa to Tokyo. So it took about three hours and uh, we had this really cool lunch on the train. You know, they, it's, the service is just outrageous. You know, it's not the yeah. Amtrak. Like, it's really <laughs> it's pretty nice. Yeah. And then we we get into Tokyo. I had never been to Tokyo before. Of course, Tony had been a million times. And uh, we were staying at the Park Hyatt, you know, the f- hotel that was famously featured in um, Lost in Translation. Uh, and, of course, Tony's like big, big VIP. So they send a driver with the Rolls Royce. And the driver literally gets on the train. 
as it stops and collects us and guides us through this intense, you know, Tokyo station is really a huge train station, yeah. guides us through into the Rolls Royce and drives us into the city to the, you know, to this magnificent hotel. Uh, <laughs> so just to have that sort of like super VIP, but very low key kind of Japanese treatment. And then that night, because wow. he didn't have to shoot because the crew was on their way, he said, well, do you want to just like go get some dinner? So we just got into a taxi and went over to Shinjuku, which is kind of an exciting, bright, you know, flashing neighborhood wow. and just got some kind of nondescript like yakitori. Uh, but just to do that with Tony, where there were no cameras, there was no performance. It right. was just strictly uh, a fun, low key dinner. And he was so genuinely pleased to be able to show somebody Tokyo for the first time, you know, yeah. a city that he really loved and he didn't really get recognized uh, and it was just, it was that to me was such a highlight to just have truly a relaxed, enjoyable dinner in, you know, one of the great cities of the world. Wow. That sounds so great. Oh man, that is an experience. Isn't yeah. it amazing? Whenever, you, whenever, whenever you hear of like, oh, experiences are better than gifts. Mm -hmm. It's really true. That is such yeah. a perfect example. Absolutely. God, you'll carry that forever. That's mm -hmm. amazing. He was, uh, being so close to him and like we see in in the book like people kind of always it seemed like all the more of the friends i think even in the family it seemed like they always kind of had a little bit of concern about his happiness or his where where it where it wasn't like a big dominant thing it seemed like there was that kind of a quiet like is he okay mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. you get that sense when you you were with him? Yeah, I would say not, uh, not all the way through. Certainly mm -hmm. there were times, you know, it really sort of depended, you know, his life was, was in a bit of turmoil when I, when I worked for him and he was mm -hmm. married and then separated and then he was in a, a new relationship. So I can sort of tell when, when things were, were up or down, right. uh, I, you know, I think I probably took him more at his word than other people. You know, my mm -hmm. job was to, was to keep him happy and keep him getting what he needed. And so when he said he was happy, I, I, I wanted to believe him, you know, and right. I think I, I think I probably bought into the romance of things maybe more than, than was when was realistic, but uh, he was pretty, he was pretty straightforward with his, you knew, you knew when he was unhappy, you know, I mean, he mm -hmm. would be, I, if you were close to him, you, he really couldn't hide it, you know? And so uh -huh. I did, what was, you know, within the boundaries of my job to try and, and keep him happy or keep him on an even keel or, or just, you know, do good work so that at least he didn't have to worry about the yeah. car not showing up or the, you know, right. make sure he gets the, you know, 2000 thread count sheets or, you know, whatever, whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. uh, we would occasionally have conversations about mental health, you know, not all the time, but mm -hmm. when, when he wanted to talk about that, I was certainly interested in listening and, uh, you know, I try and, suggest therapy because I, it's worked really well for me. And uh -huh. in all the conversations I had with him, he was like, ah, I'm too old for that. Or, you know, that's bullshit. Or, you know, he wasn't right, right. with me. He was never open to it. I know that, uh, close to the end of his life, he, he was suddenly very interested in therapy and that was mm -hmm. a great, a great thing. But unfortunately, you know, yeah, we know how this story ends. So. Right. Right. It's amazing how, uh, he, man, it's such a strange, it's, it's such a puzzle, isn't it? It's like, it's a puzzle. People are, like we said in the beginning, it, people are a puzzle to begin with, mm -hmm. but then when they, when they leave us before is natural, that puzzle becomes even more. And someone even mentions in the book to, are we even supposed to know that? Mm -hmm. Like, are we supposed to like, maybe that's, we're not supposed to find out like exactly everything about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's impossible not to sit and relive the last few days and, you know, the last conversation. And, you know, so yeah. many of us were comparing notes, of course, in the, in the immediate aftermath of just, you know, when did you talk to him? What did he say? And mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah, I, I think that we have this illusion that if we know exactly what happened, we'll somehow be okay with it. And I, Unfortunately, I don't think that's true. You know, I mean, if someone mm -hmm. were to magically, you know, be able to have video evidence or something, it still would right. be as painful because the 
the, the result is the same, you know? Right. But I think we do have to tell ourselves some kind of a story about what happened. You know, for me, I have to believe that that it was a spontaneous act. I, I, I truly don't believe that it was a, a long premeditated thing. Mm-hmm. I think it was a, a spasm of, of despair and, and, you know, these things you make a decision and, and if you act on it quickly, I mean, that's it, you know, you don't get to, yeah. to go, Oh, just kidding. You know? Right. Yeah. No, that's a, it's an interesting perspective because that's kind of the troubling thing about it just from, I mean, You know, when people are close, that's one thing. But for all of us who are just fans, what he was doing for us was showing us the world. Mm -hmm. And if and that narrative is very troubling that you showed us the world and then you left. That's like, wait, wait, wait. No, that's not supposed you're supposed to give us a sliver of hope after you saw Mm -hmm. all of this stuff. Yeah. But you're probably right. It probably had nothing to do with that as much as what he personally on a smaller level was going through with whatever his relationships were in that kind of just tumultuous time and whatever Mm -hmm. he was kind of slipping. I mean, I like to, I'm going to buy into that because I don't like to think that he saw the world and didn't see hope. Yeah, no, I don't think that's true at all. You know, I saw him, the last time I saw him in person was probably two or three weeks before he died. And uh, he was ecstatic. He was on his way to Florence and uh, they made, an episode there that he was really excited about. You can see some footage of it in the documentary that came out this summer. Um, They never actually made an episode out of it, but he Uh was, he couldn't have been happier. And he was, you know, he was really so excited about continuing to, to do that work. So I I don't think that the world ground him down. I think it was Mm -hmm. a a much more internal uh, situation. Right. Right. Well, yeah. What a loss. It's really such a shame because you, he, because the 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 writer the 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 rock star writers like the any writer the older they get the better it gets yeah. it's kind of like the cool it's kind of the greatest thing and it's like you mm-hmm. would have loved to have seen him continuing to uh, to write especially it was going through different phases and becoming a different kind of a person yeah is uh is really interesting was there was there one person i mean there's so many people in the book that you mm-hmm. spoke to was there one that really surprised you or like gave you more, more insight than others? That's a tough well, question. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, so many, but you know, Tony's brother, Christopher, uh, who I never had occasion to meet while Tony was alive. He, mm-hmm. he filled in a lot of stuff about Tony that I didn't know, you know, especially early life stuff and right. um, his relationship with his mother and his father. And, and, you know, I never met their father. He died in 1987. Uh, so I, I learned, everything I knew about Pierre from Christopher. Uh, but, but yeah, I'd say he, he was, uh, an interesting source of, of, uh, of information. Uh, it was interesting overall to hear from people, even, you know, highly, um, accomplished, very high profile people like Anderson Cooper Mm -hmm. and Nigella Lawson and Kamau Bell, who had the same sense that everyone else had that, Tony was always seemed like he was on his way somewhere and on his way to somewhere. And that he was never quite fully, it was, it was rare for him to, to be at a moment of peace and calm and really uh, ready to just hang out and have as much conversation as you might want. You know, that there was always this sense that he was on the move. And and one of his directors, Nick Brigden said, you know, he was like a shark. He sort of had to keep moving to survive. And (laughs) so it was interesting to hear that um, didn't matter like who you were in the world that, that Tony just couldn't quite slow down long enough to satisfy, you know, that we all wanted a little more time with him. Right. Yeah. I saw Anderson said something like you wanted him to like you, like you wanted, you wanted his approval. Like it's really true. You can see that. It's like, you would want that guy to think you're cool. Cause then Mm -hmm. that would be like the real deal. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) But it's interesting because when he was, when he was a cook and he was writing, he wasn't, he, he didn't really see the world yet. Like he wasn't on the move. Right. I mean, he was going to that kitchen every day. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's kind of a microcosm of, of that life within the kitchen, you know, where you're never mm-hmm. standing, you know, you got time to lean, you got time to clean. So you're never standing still. You're always trying to uh, be efficient with your movements or you're telling somebody else to keep moving. You know, there's a frenetic yeah. quality to that life. Right. Uh, but yeah, he hadn't traveled. He had been to St. Martin a handful of times and mm-hmm. France as a kid. And 
it wasn't until I think 98, he was sent to Japan uh, to, to help open the layall in Tokyo. That was his first time really anywhere outside right. of the Western hemisphere. And it just kind of blew his mind open. Yeah. And then you, you then you, it's almost like it's <clears throat> in some way, the same guy, but in, in another way. And I guess this happens with everybody in their careers. If, if, if you're working hard and moving and it's almost like three separate guys, it's like the mm-hmm. that that first you know rock and roll chef. Then it's the TV star. Then it's be, he goes into this kind of playing the role almost of a family man, mm-hmm. you know, and he, mm-hmm. his his love for his daughter and all of and that part of it. It's almost like he was reborn a couple of times. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a at least a three act kind of arc. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think he, he truly, you know, I think he truly loved being a dad, and I think he, you know, he was such a romantic that I think he also had this very idealized, I, you know, sense of what it was to have a child and be a married man and be a family man, and I think he tried his hardest to to make that successful, but it's very much at odds with with traveling, you know, two hundred fifty days a year. It really takes yeah. a toll on. A relationship and that that's um that also is touched on in the book how it just was almost impossible to make both of those things coexist yeah it's like you you, you dip in it reminded me of the uh uh the johnny cash the movie <laughs> the johnny cash like and he would come back and try and be this guy and it's like i gotta get back on the road yeah. <laughs> it's like it's too intense yeah it's i it's you know i think it's Everyone thinks it's the dream job and it was the dream life to be able to do that all the time. Yeah. But it's, uh, you know, there's a reality. There are people that get that get left behind because of it. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Uh, it's unfortunate. But 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 also beloved, like he, mm-hmm. he when he was president, he seemed like he had an effect on that on his daughter. And oh, yeah. it's, it seemed like, uh, like he was that intensity probably just as a father daughter, you know, love gun <laughs> yeah. was effective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was super into it. He was kind of yeah. like a kid himself. And so, I mean, she talks in the book about how she, they would watch um, like uh, Dexter and you know, yeah, right. Archer. I mean, shows that were not exactly uh, child friendly, yeah. but uh, yeah, she's, yeah. A, she's a super smart, super, uh, super talented kid that she's got a really good head on her shoulders. So, right. Right. Uh, what was interesting about watching the, the um, documentary, I haven't seen it in a bit, but was that there was all this footage of him before he was the guy mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. he was it was even before the, the success of his book. The cameras were rolling. Yeah, he was he was documenting it. Mm-hmm. It was like he knew where he was headed. Yeah. Well, there was a, a filmmaker uh, named Dimitri Castorine who started to make a documentary about Tony right when Kitchen Confidential was about to come out and he shot hundreds of hours of film and never actually ended up cutting it into a documentary. I'm not quite sure why he, Mm -hmm. he didn't want to be interviewed for the book, uh, but he did license all of that footage to Morgan Neville, the filmmaker who made the roadrunner documentary. So it's this really amazing gift of, of getting to see true documentary footage of Tony really before he broke out. And and a lot of the same people that were interviewed uh, in current times for the film were also interviewed back then. So you see, uh, you know, side by side footage of those people who were with him at the beginning and and right. able to comment on him at the end. So it's really, it's pretty <laughs> remarkable. It is. It reminds me of like early Bob Dylan stuff. Like before he was famous, people were taking pictures of him, you know, with his girlfriend or like a, you know on a fire mm-hmm. escape. It's like, how did he know? <laughs> yeah, you know, we'd want to see this. Some people mm-hmm. just have that. I think Tony probably always had that charisma. You know, before he yeah. published a word, I think people just and you see it in the book too. People mm-hmm. just saying. He was the best storyteller. He was the, he made things sound more fun than they were. You know, he always mm-hmm. was kind of able to rally the group to 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 do something, to have an adventure. So I think he was right. kind of born born to be that guy. You know. Yeah, yeah. So what's next for you? What are you? Uh, are you? Are you? Are you writing? Are you in the wine world? Are you in the food world? Are you leaving it all behind? Uh, <laughs> so I. Um, I'm actually working. You're going to like this. I'm working on a book about bread. So, you are. Yes. So no I'm learning, learning how to make sourdough. And I never, I didn't get into it. Uh, the early quarantine, I was like, eh, I don't care. You know, I don't eat that much <laughs> bread because I'm yeah. trying to like stay in my 
you know, pants. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but I, I'm working on a, it's going to be called a book about bread and it's with a baker called Richard Hart, who has a bakery in oh, Copenhagen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's a British guy. He was the head baker at Tartine for six years and then yeah. went over and, and opened a place in Copenhagen. So we are working on uh, what we hope will be the new uh, essential book, not just about sourdough, but also about other other breads. Uh, so it's, it's oh, really that's fun. Great. Yeah. I read about him. I, I, I probably, I follow, I mean, bread people are my rock stars Yeah, <laughs> and I travel all over and, and visit them and stuff. And I think him, I might've read an interview. It was the him going to Copenhagen because mm-hmm. when I was during the pandemic, sorry to go off the rails, but when oh, uh, during the pandemic, I would, I was for some reason craving I would have my iPad. I was craving places like Copenhagen mm. and and uh, and like the Germanic breads. And mm. I was like, I was putting together my travel list of like where I would like to go. But Copenhagen just seemed like when you start looking at those bakeries, they're so clean yes. and they're so dialed in. Yeah, yeah. That's a it's a fascinating. This is going to be a great book. Yeah, I spent two weeks in Copenhagen in July, just like hanging out at the bakery. Uh, they didn't let me touch anything <laughs> for like the first two weeks. They were like, Ugh. I mean, you know, and I know what I'm doing, but like it's yeah. a whole different thing. So by the end, I was allowed to, to start uh, pre-shaping loaves uh-huh. and uh, you know, they would, this girl next to me would do like 40, you know, and I would be like, I have like two, you know, and then right. they would just take it and reshape it anyway. So it's really, you know, it's like Humbling. the simplest and most complex thing in the world, as I'm sure, you know. Yeah, it really is amazing. It's it's amazing the, in that regard. What's amazing to me is that the same sticky, high, overly hydrated bread in the mm-hmm. hands of someone that knows what they're doing does not stick. And in the mm-hmm. hands of someone who doesn't know what they're doing or just doesn't know enough, it's sticking all over the place. That yeah. to me is pretty remarkable. Yeah, it's that light touch. Richard says it's a ballet, not a boxing match. <laughs> oh, that's oh. brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, I can't wait. When do you think that'll be next year? Maybe that'll, yeah, we, uh, I I think they're looking to do it early 2023. So, Mm -hmm. which feels like a million years away, but then when I look at how much work we have to do, it feels like shit. we better, uh, better get on this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite kind of wine? Well, you know, I quit drinking about four years ago, so it's all Turkey, all, all of it. Yeah. Well, I quit drinking and then it took another 18 months to quit smoking weed, which I really, you know, I did it like it was my job for a long time. So I've been (laughs) truly sober for almost three years. Um, While I was at Wine Spectator, I mean, it was like, well, what's, you know, what's close to my desk that I can open around noon? (laughs) (laughs) I'm working. (laughs) Yeah. I I loved, I did really loved uh, drinking. So um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's been so long now. I mean, I, you know, mm-hmm. I always liked to, I liked a Riesling. I liked sort of the stuff that's was like a little bit uh, more obscure, but um, uh-huh. I don't know. Yeah. I really, honestly, I was not super picky. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> All these people looking to you for guidance. You're like, ah, yeah. <laughs> like, have you tried AA? That's, that's really, <laughs> right. they have great coffee. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you, uh, do you feel better? So Do you sleep better. better? Oh, yeah. 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 Just a whole different. I mean, you know what? If people can drink safely and responsibly, like, that's great. I've got no sure. no issue with that. For me, it was just it just was progressively more and more dangerous. And, you know, I have a friend who's a uh, who's a medical examiner in New York, and he like deals with dead people all day long, you know, and he yeah. said, like, saw how I was drinking was like, you're going to die. You know, you might not get cirrhosis, but you're going to step into traffic or you're going to fall downstairs or you're going to get into a cab with the wrong person. And first I was like, ah, fuck you. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> um, but you hear that enough and you start to go, mm-hmm, yeah, maybe he's onto something. So I didn't have a dramatic rock bottom, but I'm, I'm glad, you know, I didn't, I didn't lose anything significant. Uh, but yeah, for me, uh, it's, it's, it was a great decision. And yeah, uh, you know. well, that's great. Good for you. Good for you. That is a, it's, it's a, it, 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 there's, they're very sneaky substances. Mm -hmm. They're, they're just so romantic and so wonderful. And Mm -hmm. then before you know it, I almost, I always say with alcohol specifically that it's like drowning. Like when people drown, it's silent. Yeah. It's just this kind of quiet slip. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with drinking. You don't really realize it until you pop your head up. You're like, whoa, I've been doing this a little more than I should have. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. 
But man, the one thing Anthony did, which I'll probably never shake, was uh, he made smoking look really cool. (laughs) (laughs) Really did. Right. Mm -hmm. As a writer, don't you feel like, Mm -hmm. oh, just like that romantic thing, like you just finished writing a couple chapters and you sit outside wherever you are and just think for a minute like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He quit for a while and then he got back on it. And again, like with a vengeance, you know, it was like, (laughs) I'm either going to smoke, you know, four packs of Marlboro Reds a day or I'm going to smoke again. And (laughs) we we had this meeting at his apartment and I had had to have a a smoke eater installed in his apartment because people were complaining in his building (laughs) about how much he was smoking and it was coming in, you know, through their, their walls and ceilings. So we had this like casino grade smoke eater so that he continued to smoke with abandon in his apartment. And we were having a meeting and I was kind of sitting under it and he was facing me and he was smoking constantly. And so the smoke was being drawn, like basically filtered through me first and then up into the thing. And I walked out of there smelling like a, you know, like a bar from the 1990s. Just yeah. Like, Thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah. That, all right. That, that helps me a little, that takes a little of the romance yeah. off. Yeah. It's gross. <laughs> yeah. It's disgusting. <laughs> Well, congratulations. Good on you again. I Thank know this. I, I mean, it's cathartic and wonderful and hard and, and all the rest of it. This is this was a heavy lift, but you're one of the only people that really could have done it and done it really thoughtfully. And and you you did. And it's it's the great kind of book that you really can bounce around. Mm-hmm. I love that you can mm-hmm. uh, books like this. You literally just open at any point and then you you get a little more nugget. And it's one of those little I'll stick around on my end table forever. It's oh, really good. well done. Good. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Enjoy making bread and, and uh, we'll talk Thanks. when that one comes out. Sounds good. Thank All you. All right. Thank Bye. you so much, Lori. Bye. All right. That's it, everybody. Thank you so much to Lori Williver for joining us. Go get the book. It's Bourdain, the definitive oral biography. She's amazing. Thank you to our good friends at Scribd. You guys are the best. We'll see you next week. Enjoy your day. 